Okay, so we're up to chapter 28, verse 29. And Rashi says, um, after it says, God will strike you down with insanity and blindness and confusion of the heart, it says, Vayita mimashesh bitzarayim. You will be feeling around in the afternoon like a blind man gropes in the dark. And your path will not be successful. And you will be harried and robbed all your days and there will be no savior. She says, Ashuk, you will, all that you do, you'll be harried. Yeah, Arur, there will be contention. Everything will be a struggle. But when it says you'll be like a blind man gropes in the darkness. But a blind man is always in darkness. So why does it say you're going to grope around in the daytime like a blind man gropes in the darkness? It should just say like a blind man gropes. Follow my question? So I was thinking about this in the light of a Gemara. Uh, I forget exactly where the Gemara is. Maybe Rabbi Yosef can Google it and find the actual text. The, there, the Gemara tells a story, maybe this is in Makos or Titus, I don't remember exactly, where an Amorak sees a blind man carrying a torch. And he says, you're blind. Why are you carrying a torch? And he says, I can't see, but if I have a light, somebody near me who can see can show me which way to walk. And so therefore, that's what this means. It's a double blindness. The blind man will be groping in the uh, the blind man will be groping in the darkness, meaning to say he'll be blind and he won't have anybody else who can help him. Okay, then the verse says, Isha Ta'ares. Hello, hello, my friend. Isha Ta'ares, a woman you will betroth, the Isha Kher. Now, here we have another. We have another example of what's called the Kri Uktiv. It's written one way and it's read the other way, but this time Rashi translates the word. It's written as Yisha Glena, but we translate it as Yishka Vena. Another man will lie with her. Bias, and the word Yisha Glena and Rashi does translate, we'll see what it means. Bias Tivne, Shevo, the house you will build and you will not get to live in it. We're in chapter 28, verse 30. What? Okay. Karem, Karem, Tita, You will plant a vineyard and you will not get to use it. But here Rashi explains the very, very, very important Rashi. Rashi explains what's the reasoning why. Hey, 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 boys, how you guys doing? Let's go. Hi, Kobe. Hey, Moshe. Rashi explains why. There's what's called a kri uktif here. Why the word is written one way. It's written yishaglana, but we read it as yishkavena. Yishkavena means to lie down. And Rashi says the word yishkalena means lashon shigal, shigal pilegesh. It's, uh, it's uh, like a sexual term of lying with a concubine. Vakas of kino is shevach yishkavena. So the verse uses a euphemism. He will lie down with her, but the actual text is said, oh, so it's Megillah 24b. Thank you, Rabbi Yosef, that story. Maybe we'll read this story in a moment, but first let me finish this thought. So the text, Rashi writes here, V'tikun sofrim huzeh. This is an emendation of the scribes. That's a very, very unusual, uh, very provocative uh, formulation. What is going on there? So, means to say the text was supposed to be written as Yisha, Yishkalena, which is a vulgar term for lying with the woman, like you lie with a concubine, and it was substituted with a euphemistic term of Yishkavena lie down. The question is, who made this tikkun? So, so that's a whole debate. That's a very, very big debate. The uh, if you go here, Rabbi Yosef has pulled up 
Rabbi Yosef, before you go to uh, Megillah 24b, which is the story that I referenced, can you pull up, please, Megillah 25b, which discusses this concept of Tikkun Sofrim, who's that? That this is an that this is an emendation of the scribes, and we'll see what the Gemara says. Megillah twenty five b. The Gemara discusses this. So let's see what it says. Make this bigger. Okay, hold on, hold on. I gotta go slow. Okay, where is it? Did we pass it yet? We go down, go down. Okay. Um, go down, go on, oh, wait, 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 wait. go back up, go, oh, wait, 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 go down, go down, go down, go down, go down, go down, we just came to it, go down a little bit, okay, Tanu Rabbanan, Ko Mikraot Haktuvim Bitora Lignai, Korino Sama Shabach. All the verses that are written in the Torah in a vulgar manner, we we read them in a refined manner. To go on Yishkalena Yishkavena, Ba'apoim Batchorim. So these are the two examples we had in the last two days. And Chiryonim and Divyonim. The this is a reference to a text um, Kings. from Kings. When, they were, when they were starving. And they were starving. Did they eat their um, Chicken, their, the their dung or or tir chirionim dibionim the doves or the p- pigeon poop. Lachol et choreihem l'shtot et mei mei shinehem. Lachol et so atam l'shtot et mei mei ragleihem. So to so we go down a little bit. Go down. See what the Gemara then says. Um, okay. Anyway, go down a little bit. They're just giving another example. Let's see what else the Gemara says here. So, okay, go down a little bit. Okay, so they don't, the Gemara doesn't doesn't use this term there called tikkun sofrim. Gemara doesn't use the term there, but I forget exactly where the first time this term was introduced was, but the idea of it being written in a euphemistic manner was included in the Gemara. But the question is, who wrote it, who changed it and wrote it euphemistically? So the Maral says it was the Torah. That's what the Torah itself did, which is difficult to understand. And then it should have just said one word. It wouldn't have written both words. So some are of the opinion that Moshe did it, and then Moshe changed the Torah. Some say the later rabbis, the Anshe Mesorah, did it. It's obviously very, very controversial that if you say that a word of the text was edited or modified in order to... Uh, make it sanitized. Very, very controversial or provocative idea. Everybody with me? Anyway, that's what the text says. And and you see the Gemara McGill gives gave like seven or eight examples of this, of the euphemistic words. Yes, uh Jerry, please, please, Jerry, educate us. Uh somehow my uh computer uh conked out while you were giving the explanation. Uh, what is the uh, uh, derogatory term that, uh, that, that the word in the Torah means? Did you, were you able to find? Yeah, the, the word shegal is like related, Rashi says, pilegesh, concubine. The word concubine is very vulgar because it implies the man will have a relationship with this woman. He's going, they're going to take your wives and they're going to treat them in a very disrespectful manner. So therefore it was considered to be uh, very vulgar. And so they substituted it with a word that's somehow less vulgar, more refined. Hemorrhoids. What? Hemorrhoids. Oh no, that was from yesterday. So the word we did yesterday is the same idea. The word apolim is just a more refined way of saying techorim. They both mean hemorrhoids, but they're both uh, more, uh, supposedly, according to the Gemara, and according to this professor who I quoted at the beginning, they're, they're both just, it's just a more refined version of the same word. But it's again, why is this word considered to be more 
uh, palatable than the other word. And I guess part of it is just the way language was spoken and what the words meant and what's considered a vulgar term and what's not. But the real question to my mind is who made this change? And how did they have the authority to make a change in the text of the Torah? That's where it gets very complicated. And in fact, the, the problem is if the Maral is obviously who am I to challenge the Maral? Chas for Shalom. But there are many, there are other commentaries who disagree with him. The challenge is if this really is the case that it's God doing it, then why is it called tikkun sofrin? The word mean tikkun means to fix, and sofrin means scribes means that the scribes fixed this. That's something totally different. Totally different. Not that, that means the scribes came along and fixed it. So it's a totally different idea than God uh, giving the Torah in these two different manners. And also, if it was God doing it in a euphemistic manner, then why write it at all? Just write the euphemistic word. So it's a big, it's a very uh, mysterious idea. The phrase tikkun sofrim, I forget how many times it appears in Rashi and the Torah, but I think it appears like three or four times, especially based upon the Gemara. Yeah, Rabbi Yossi, if you're trying to say it does something. say that it strengthens our belief in the oral Torah, that that there is such a thing, because a lot of people don't. And I'm saying if, if Hashem deliberately wrote one way, but told you to read it a different way, it's it's so that you would know that there is such a thing as Torah Shabbat. And... and I just I think it's like I I I looked at a site a couple of weeks ago that they were trying to say that there's 222 contradictions between the, the oral Torah and the written Torah, and and most of their examples are 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 baloney, and so so uh, all I'm saying is that if if we have the 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 Gemara was before uh, the ninth century when that. The rabbis in Tiberius wrote the Tamim and all that. So, uh, so obviously it's it's an ancient idea, and we should just uh, believe that that that's how it's supposed to be. I I, I, I mean, the only question is, I uh, uh, the question is, the problem with that is, if you want to say, hold on, I'm just seeing if they comment on this. If you want to say that the rabbis edited it. That's a big problem because Ramam writes that you have to say that every single letter and word of the Torah was given by God to Moses. Uh, and so this is an emendation. So you have to say that the Ramam meant, except for these words. But and also, can we just change the Torah? Can we just change the words of the Torah that we don't want? God forbid. But that's what Tikkun Sofram is. It's not, it was uh, vulgar, so we changed it. Here. If you Google what is Tikkun Sofram, you'll see like four or five different explanations uh, that run the gamut from this being a word uh, like, the, uh, like the most uh, um, conservative opinion with a small c, i.e. that this was God gave the Torah this way, to the most uh, radical that the rabbis of the Gemara decided to, to introduce these euphemistic words. Okay, so now... Up to the next verse, maybe you you can find that uh, article for us, Rabbi Yosef, if you find that. I'm you sure you'll find the it. star of Rabbi Yosef first, no? Which one? Oh. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Go back to twenty four. Uh, I, I did. Twenty four. You have it. Okay. Yeah, I do. Sorry. Ah, oh. so okay, so this is the Gemara Megillah twenty four B. This is what the Gemara I just cited. By uh by heart, and here it is. We learned in the Brisa, uh, um, all the days of my life, Kol Yamai All the days of my life, I was upset about this verse, or I was in distress. It says Vayisam Mashresh Pesarayim that you will that you will feel around during the afternoon. Kasher Yimashesh Ha'iver Ba'Filo, just like a blind man gropes about in the dark, and the Gemara says V'Chimach Ba'Filo Ha'iver Beim. What's the difference for a blind man if it's dark, if it's light? So, says until I came to the following incident. One time I was walking along in the dark. And I saw the blind man, and I was walking along the road. 
He had a torch in his hands. Amar Tilo, I said to him, Beneath, my son, why do you have this torch? And he said to me, Calls Mancha, Vukabiyadi, as long as I have a torch, Bene Adam, Rowan Osim, Matsion Osim, and Apsachim, and Akosim Barak. And the blind man says, As long as I have a porch, uh, as long as I have a torch, the people around me are able to see and save me. Right. And that's why the blind man carries the light with him. So in the time the so then what's this curse? This curse is that you'll that in the time the curse is that somebody will grow blind and there will be nobody around to help him, that the blind man won't even bother carrying a torch because he knows nobody's going to help him. Nobody's going to care enough to help him. And that's a tremendous curse. Um Okay, so we come up to the next verse. They'll slaughter your ox in front of your eyes. You won't be able to eat. Your donkeys will be stolen from before you. will not return to you. Your sheep will be given over to your enemies. And there'll be nobody to save you. Or save it. Your sons and your daughters, will be given to another nation. Your eyes will see. And they'll be pining for them all day. And there will be no God, and, and your hand will be powerless. You know what? I just want to stop the recording to say a bit of good news. Uh, Continue now. It says, "Pri admatcha v'chol yigiacha yochal am asher lo yadata." The fruits of your land and all your hard work will be eaten by an, a people that do not know you. Vayisi ra vayisa rak ashuk for atzutz kol yamim. You will be hassled and downtrodden all the days. That's such a tremendous curse that you can't even appreciate your life. Vayisa mishuga. You will be insane. You'll go mad from the sight of your eyes that you will see. God will hit you down with boils on your knees, on your thighs. You'll be unable to be healed. From the sole of your foot to your crown. God will lead you and your kingdom that you've uh, established for yourself to a nation that you do not know, you and your fathers. And you will work there for other gods, wood and stone. What does it mean you'll work there? You'll do menial labor. They'll, they'll have you working for the idols. Vaiso is Shama. You will be for an astonishment. Rashi says the word Shama is the French word astor de son, which means bewilderment. Whoever, whoever sees you will be astonished over you. You'll be a parable and a topic of conversation. So, like when something, God forbid, when a harsh blow falls upon a person, they'll say, Oh, this is similar to the troubles of this guy. And with Shina is a topic of conversation, Rashi says, Vishinan Tom. You shall they'll they'll use you as a teaching lesson. Rashon Sipur, uh, 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 retelling the Ishtai. Zerarav Totsia Sadeh, you will take abundant seed out to the field, but you'll gather in just a little. Because the locusts will eat your, your stuff. You will plant the vineyards and you will work them. You won't drink the wine. You won't gather it in. The worms will eat it. Rashi says the locusts will ravage it. The will obliterate it. Therefore, it's called chasil. A locust is called a chasil. It obliterates everything. You'll have olives in all your borders, but you won't be able to produce oil. For your olive tree will shed. 
Alan, remember when we tried to make olive oil? And, and we had the idea that we're going to put the olive oil, olives. I had this idea. I take full responsibility and credit for it. I said, we're going to just try crushing the olives in the in the garbage disposal. That maybe could turn into olive oil. I'm going to give everybody a quick tutorial that did not work. You cannot make olives by putting them into a garbage disposal. You cannot make olive oil. Instead, we broke the garbage disposal. Remember that? Yeah. Then we tried a hydraulic press. It also didn't work. It's not so simple. It's not as easy as you think to make the olive oil. Yeah, Raj, he says it will drop its fruit. Lashon Nashala Barzel. And and then it states in the verse. You have two minutes. You want to do the Tikkun Safrim? Oh, you have that thing here? Yeah, let's see. Where is it? Okay. Okay, let's say. Okay, what's where is this from? Oh, Allah Torah. That's from uh my friends, the no the Novetskis, the wonderful people. Okay, what do this they do? Minchachai. Oh, so what is the Minchachai? Do we know he is? He's at the end of Every Mikro's Kedolos. Okay, hold on. Tikkun Sofrim. Some say that it was from the Anshe Knesset Hagdola. These are the, you know, the men of the Great Assembly in the time of uh, leading up to the Mishnah, that they instituted these words. So that's one source. Um He, say, he rejects that because how can we say that they'll change the words of the text? And the Bawa Ikarim says, nobody can possibly do this. So how do we say it's a Tikkun Sofrim? So he says the main explanation is like what the Rashba says, that the each of the 18 verses yeah, yeah, no, he says he says right here. The yeah, Rosh, saying, the Rosh, calling Yan that each one of those eighteen verses had to be corrected. Um, no, basically, the they said that this is that each of these verses were written euphemistically, and they explained what they meant. So we're just not reading what the real word is. We're discussing the phrase that there are certain words in our text that are written one way and read a different way. And Rashi says it was an emendation of the scribes. They use that phrase, tikkun sofrim, which, the, which uh, some say means that that's how it was written uh, by God. But uh, then he quotes, who was the first one he quoted? Who said, oh, that, who said it was the Antje Knesset Agdoa? The Rashba. No, no, the Rashba was below. Who was the first one we read? Oh, anyway, uh, there's the Minchat, one thing. The Minchat Chai. Oh, the Minchat Chai says it was the Rashba says it was the rabbis explaining what the what the euphemism of the Torah was. Anyway, there's a lot there, but like I said, it's a very provocative phrase and causes a lot of theological issues. Uh, uh, if you want to take the the position that every single letter was, was the way we have it was given by God to Moses at Sinai, this presents a challenge to that approach. All right, we'll stop here. And he brought the quote from the Mara at the end that, that you said uh, exactly like yeah. you said. It. Yeah. Okay. did not write it, that Hashem himself uh, told it. to write it like that.